here is Pastor Murray. We just ask his guidance and his blessings upon America. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, I've told you many times that Jesus did not ask, saying, maybe you should learn the parable of the fig tree, but he said, learn the parable of the fig tree. Never before have I taught that parable on television, therefore we're going to. You'll find that it's quite lengthy. It'll take two or three sessions. But you must know that parable of the fig tree. It's extremely important concerning especially the final generation, which I think after we finish the parable, you'll understand this is the last generation. That generation that Jesus set aside in the closing verse of Psalms 22, his words as he hung upon the cross, words that give many of you a destiny. So turn with me. Let's begin in Matthew chapter 7. Let's lay a little groundwork. Let's do the parable of the fig tree. God uses his own nature many times as an example to simplify the spiritual, which is the unseen. That is to say, to make it very simple. And as you've heard me many times say, bring it to the simplicity in which Christ taught. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, Christ taught those that were with him. Beware of false prophets. It's always that warning. That's false teachers, which come to you in sheep's clothing. They're dressed like Christians, in other words. But inwardly, they are raving wolves. They simply want to take you in, strip you down, strip the very clothes off your back, if you would, take what they can from you, and mislead you at the same time. Verse 16. You shall know them by their fruits. Now, it's he could have gone into a long dissertation of what false prophets teach, etc., etc., but I want you to note the way he simplifies it. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns? No, you gather grapes off of a, a vine, a grapevine. Or figs of thistles? No, you do not gather figs from thistles. You gather them from fig trees. You see how simple God makes it? If I were to take that further, or one step further, many would think that I was talking down to them and perhaps would be. It's just that simple. If you go over to an orange tree and it's got one, it's, it's producing apples on part of it, there's something wrong. God didn't create that tree because God doesn't mix things. He remains things in there. He allows things to remain in their purity. He created them that way. So, again, the parable of the fig tree. How do you know the false teachers? By their fruits. Well, give us an example, all right? If someone teaches something foreign or different to God's word, or let us say they would read one scripture, one little scripture from a chapter that may be talking about plowing cotton, and they take that verse and turn it into drilling for oil. Something's wrong. Can you follow that? In other words, it's not of God's word. Therefore, they become not necessarily knowingly false teachers, but they teach that verse falsely for it's taken out of context. There's nothing perhaps oft times using a verse as an example to set forth a, a setting for an evangelist, but not for a teacher. A teacher cannot do that. He cannot afford that. He must teach the word in context or he becomes a false teacher. So with that thought in mind, let's continue on with verse 17, which reads, Even so, every good tree, what are we talking about? Every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Now what was the example from the beginning? It was about the trees, the trees in the garden. One of the first lessons and orders laid down by Almighty God to man concerning trees. He said, hey, you can go out there and you can partake of the, the fruit trees that I have created. They will sustain you. But there is one tree you keep your hands off uh, from. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is simply to say Satan, 
this being the trunk of his body and these arms or legs being the limbs thereof of that false tree, that tree that lied to Eve, the old serpent. And then also in that garden was the tree of life. What is the tree of life? Christ is life, eternal life. Can you relate to that now? Christ's tree is a good tree. It produces good fruit. Satan's tree is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's where the wolves come from. That's where the Kenites, his own children, he that slipped in the field and planted his own seed, produced his own offspring. But God so loves the creation and the souls that he created, not Satan, that he will allow even then to believe upon that good tree, to partake of that good tree. I did not say naga for the deeper scholar that might try to read something into that, and I speak the Hebrew. Then, and have eternal life. Even they, he does not forbid that good fruit to them. So he said, in a sense, life is that way. Don't worry about being misled. If someone mis, if you attend a church that doesn't instruct you that you do not grow familiar with God's word, that you don't grow in it, then get out of it. It's dead. It's not producing fruit. You see, it can produce bad fruit, but to produce no fruit at all is just as bad practically. So I don't really see anything too difficult about that, that one taking all those points in, into mind that he should have any difficulty with. 18. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. If you find once that it's a good tree, hang on to it. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. It just isn't going to happen. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. In other words, those people, those children, those souls that will not produce fruit. That is to say, that's why it's not just good enough to say, I hope I can make it got to produce fruit. It's going to be cut down and cast into the fire. That's the lake of fire. You know when that takes place. The closing verses of chapter 20 in the book of Revelation. It's going to happen. Praise God, no one will go there in ignorance because the millennium's coming when the true time of teaching shall be. Thank God for the teachers that we have even at this time that teach his word, not the words of man. Verse 20 to conclude. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Know who? Know the false prophets. Know the good prophets. Know the good teachers. Know the bad teachers. Don't make a big thing out of it. If you can't, if you cannot uh, discern from a by having a, a possessing a learned ear, then learn simply by watching them, seeing what they produce, what their ministry produces, etc. Then you know whether it's a good tree or a bad tree. There are exceptions in every ministry that a bad egg can happen. But overall, you can tell by the fruits, the type people, the type people, I'm not speaking of classes, I'm talking about those that have a dedication, would even give their lives to Almighty God in service to Him. He comes first. You can tell by the dedication of the fruit, that's to say those that study in that ministry, they're, they're what type fruit the very tree itself produces. Ultimately, it's very simple. If uh, you teach the teachings and instruction of the tree of life, which is the good fruit, you're going to produce good fruit. If you listen to the traditions of man, which brings in deception, that's why he used the word back in verse 15, beware, and you'd better. For there are many deceivers entered into the world, and they would love to have you in their organization. By whatever title or name it might go under, what flag it might fly, or what banner it might have over its door. Okay, now let's get down to the nitty-gritty. Let's go to Mark 13. I choose it over Matthew 24 to lay the foundation of the parable of the fig tree. Let's go back. We just covered this in a, a session not long ago, but I insist that we uh, remember the setting. Christ is giving the seven signs, which are the seven seals in the book of Revelation that would happen in the end time. The deception, the Apollyon standing in Jerusalem claiming to be Christ, 
the first tribulation, the second tribulation, how that many of the virgins that were waiting for the wedding would already be with child when he returned because they would fall off in a wrong wedding. Then we came to that 28th verse in Mark 13. Let us read it and analyze. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. Again, you've heard me say it many times. He didn't say maybe you should get around to it. Uh, he didn't say, I wish you would. He said, learn it. And it's important to you, beloved. There's only one key to that lock of David that will open the scriptures to the point that you can discern the final generation. This is that key. That's why he said, learn it. That's why I felt led to teach this before we go on to other teachings. Because it is, I have never taught it on television in the last four or five years. And it's time. Learn the parable of the fig tree when her branch is yet tender. That means, um, speaking um, uh, from the point of the horticulture of the fig, when the shoot is very tender, it's small, it's just coming forth, and putteth forth leaves. I want you to note, not fruit, no fruit, but leaves. Ye know that summer is nigh. When is summer? Summer is harvest. In other words, Christ says, that's when I will harvest this earth. When you see that shoot come forth. That shoot happened in 1948 when Israel became a nation. Yet there were two fruits planted there, both the good and the bad. I will document that as well. But there was a time sequence given from this. Why did the fig not produce fruit? We'll find that out in just a little bit. It only shot forth a leaf. Then why is this so important? Let's go on with verse 29. So ye in like manner. In other words, this is the exact same manner. This is the exact same way it's going to be. Speaking of his return. When ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the door. Let's continue on the next verse, 30. Verily, this, this is truly, I could not be any more serious with you, he's saying. I say unto you that this generation, you got, you got it? This generation shall not pass till all these things be done. In other words, all seven of these events will take place before the generation of 1948 is passed. It's very, there's really not a great deal to ponder, we could wonder, well, how long is a generation? Well, a generation before they entered the promised land, which we're about to do, was 40 years. That would make that time fall sometime in 1988. I'm telling you as a watchman, I'm not saying that's when Christ will return, but I'm telling you, you'd better watch for the signs uh, are there. And furthermore, it is written. Not in man's hand, but in the word of Almighty God. Now, let's recap that so we have it real well. Jesus giving the seven signs that would consummate the end of this earth age and bring in his return. He said, let me tell you something. Don't mess around. Put it off. Learn the parable of the fig tree. When you see it and those things that pertain to it, then know that this generation will not pass away until all these things have been completed. Okay, now before you can understand the parable of the fig tree, you must know a little bit about the fig. That's the way Christ teaches. That's an example of the scorpion in Revelation chapter 9. There's no way you can understand what's going to happen to the people that are deceived unless you understand the um, habits and the lifestyle of the scorpion how he takes his prey, etc. Well, likewise with the fig tree. You're not going to understand the fig tree unless we go into the horticulture of it just a little bit. There are many various uh, modern-day types figs, but basically and from the beginning, I think we could say they all come from two uh, at the given point of time we're addressing. And let us take first the Smyrna fig tree. The Smyrna fig tree is the female fig. All right, the female fig. Now the capri, 
The capri is the male fig, and the fruit is not edible. It's terrible. It's not fit to eat. Yet, there's a strange thing that happens. Many people say that a fig tree is a non-flowering plant or a tree. That's not true. For in the end of each fig, there's a small hole. And within that fig, the fruit itself, there are thousands of blossoms. Thousands of blossoms. And you know what? There's a little fig wasp. Wasp. That abides in the goat fig or the capri fig, whichever you wish to call it. It's known as the goat fig. And within that, it travels from there, and it goes to the female fig. It enters that small hole into the flowering plant, the fig itself, and pollinates, etc. So there you have basically the makeup. Now, you do not plant a fig tree from a seed. You plant it from a shoot. Therefore, you know and understand from the horticulture that the shoot that happened, that was planted or shot forth its tender leaves, was set out, not planted, but set out, set in place. Those you scholars of Daniel, that should mean something to you. Uh, set in place in the year 1948. Now, from uh, a philosopher's viewpoint, what about a fig tree? It's known as a plant of wisdom. This is not true, for all wisdom comes from God. Unfortunately, many times in relationship to the fig, the wisdom that is gathered thereby is not wisdom that God's children need know. And we'll, we'll learn that as we go into this parable. Buddha himself supposedly gained all his wisdom while sitting under a bow tree, which is the largest species of the fig. So let that be. This fig usually stands, even the fig leaf, for something hidden, something secret, not, not in a good sense necessarily, but most usually in a bad sense. So there you have the fig, both the good and the bad, but that little wasp unfortunately is used to keep both the good and the bad fig going. Do you understand? Now, you that uh, have ears to hear, you think a little bit. I said the wasp keeps both the good and the bad fig going by nature itself. Too bad in some cases in the standpoint of philosophy as well as theology. Okay, so let's continue. Now that we have that groundwork laid, Let's go back one chapter, two chapters, to Mark chapter 11. Let's learn a little more about the fig tree. Let's learn what Jesus meant when he related things to the fig tree. Chapter 11 in the book of Mark, verse 11, let's go with it. Let's cover some ground now. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked around about upon all things... And now the even time was come. In other words, there wasn't time to do anything about it. It was late. But as he looked around upon these things, anger came into his face, as it is well recorded. For he could see the leftovers of what had happened in his father's temple that day. The eventide was come, and he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. So we can see then the remains, the leftovers of what had happened. You know, the money changers and those filthy, mite infested doves that they kept in cages there, right in the temple floor, the entrance, 12. On the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. This would have been, for those that are interested, Monday of the Holy Week, 13. And seeing a fig tree, sharpen up, a fig tree afar off having leaves, underline leaves in your mind. He came, if haply he might find anything thereon. 
And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, uh, for the time of figs was not yet. Now, do you think that Jesus Christ would not have known that it was out of season for figs? Of course he knew it. He's teaching a lesson that is part of the parable of the fig tree that he expects you to know. He will relate this to the evil figs. In part, the money changers that were in that temple, those that had taken over his father's house, the bad figs sitting where the good fig should have, to teach you a lesson. In other words, he went to a tree out of season to plant a lesson. I doubt that some of the disciples even understood overall of what he spoke. He intends for you in this day and hour too, because specifically in this generation, he intended you to know this parable of the fig tree, the message he was teaching. Verse 14. And Jesus answered and said unto it, it being what? Greek is very specific. We're addressing the fig tree. No man eat fruit off thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Well, here's the Lord Jesus Christ talking to a fig tree. Putting a curse on the thing. But again, beloved, let your mind run back to the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What he has said here, this was a bad fig tree. Let no one ever again eat bad figs. Are you wise enough that you won't partake of a bad fig? I guarantee you once you flop your lip over it, you'll unload it quicker than you took it in. But sometimes people are slow learners. The lesson is simple and adequate for those that have ears to hear. 15. And they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple. Now understand these two are, are related. This is the lesson. He went into the temple and he began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple. You know, in another gospel it is reported that he took a whip, a cat of nine tails, I'll say, and he went in and he laid it to their backs and he upset their money table. And if you ever want to get a Kenite upset, bother his money table. And overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. You know what those filthy, mite-infested doves, people would come there and say, I want to make a blood sacrifice to the altar. They didn't own the sacrifice. They bought a token as they entered. It wasn't the first fruits of their flock. It was a mighty infested poor excuse uh, of playing religion. And Jesus disapproved to no end. In other words, what do we have? We have the bad figs in the temple. And what he's referring to is when Antichrist returns to this earth as he taught so complete and no one should be left wanting. From that 13th chapter of Mark and the 24th chapter of Matthew, where that Antichrist would sit in the temple. He said, Daniel told you about it. When you see the abomination of the desolator spoken of by Daniel sitting here, no, that's it. That's pretty plain, friend. He drove them out. Christ raised his voice. Christ showed anger, righteous indignation, laying the whip to the back uh, of those money changers and driving those might-infested doves uh, from our Father's house. Verse 16. Let me tell you something just before we start 16. He's returning again very soon. He's going to show righteous indignation again. He's going to clean more than his father's house. He's going to clean this entire world. He's going to throw everything out that does not belong. He's going to clean house. I'll tell you what, he's going to shape this old ship up. So you better be prepared for it. It's going to happen in this generation. That's why you're studying this fig tree now. That's why Christ used the fig tree in relationship and in conjunction with uh, the money changers in his father's house. 
Have you heard of any money changers in the Father's house lately? Oh, no, we don't have that in Christianity. You don't? How many people do you know that claim to be teachers that spend over half their time in the money changer end of the cathedral? Verse 16. And would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. We're going to go back to the way it should be. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written? Oh, how often Christ used those words. And beloved, if I can get you to only see how important it is to your life, you don't have to worry about the answer. I wish someone would give me the answer. I tell you, it is written. It is written, My, my house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer. But ye have made it a den of thieves. All you've got in there is a bunch of thieves. <clears throat> ripping off the people, bringing true offerings to God. God never sees any of it. They pick pockets of, in a spiritual sense, put it in their priest, put it in their own pockets, and abscound with it. And if you think I'm talking about any one particular man, you're mistaken. I'm talking about all of them that take money and don't produce fruit. They're fake. What kind of fruit? If you don't know that by now, you'll never know. Verse 18. And the scribe and chief priest heard it and sought how they might destroy him. You understand what kind of... I want you to see... The, what did Christ tell you? Test the fruit. What are these priests and scribes talking about? Do you know what the word destroy means? To kill him. They're murderers. Not only are they thieves and robbers, but they're murderers. What kind of fruit is that, friend? You ever had a sour apple in your barrel? It'll ruin the whole barrel. Get rid of it. Go to the simplicity in which Christ taught concerning testing fruit and the fig tree and shape your act up. You get with those that teach the word and come away from those that wear sheep's clothing and play church. For they feared him because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. They knew truth when they heard it, the same as people today know truth when they hear it. It's time to stop playing church. There's no more time. Christianity is not a religion, it's a reality. You're living it. Every war that is being fought on this earth today or conflict is a religious conflict. Wake up. Well, communists are not even religious. They're atheists and that is a religion. And it is that Esau still trying to retain his birthright which was sold to Jacob, which makes up America, Canada, many two of our neighbors to the south, Great Britain. He wants it back. 19. And when, when even was come, he went out of the city. Well, he had set things straight for that day. But again, he's coming to set it straight for another day, the long day, the Lord's day. 20. And in the morning, this would be Tuesday, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Christ cursed it. You understand that? Your Lord and Savior cursed it. <clears throat> 21. And Peter calling to remembrance. Just the next day. It shouldn't have been too difficult for him to remember. Saith unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. You think it was any surprise to Christ? No, that lesson was not necessarily done for Peter's sake, but for yours today, in the generation that it applies to. He killed it. And when he returns and drives the money changers from the world, he'll wither it again. If it doesn't produce fruit, it might as well be dead. Now listen for a much deeper thought, 22. And Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God. Have faith in the... We haven't hardly taken a deep breath from Peter's remembrance of the fig. It still pertains, still connected, still in conjunction therewith. 30, 23. For verily, he's saying, I'm very serious with you again. I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, do you know what a mountain is? It's a nation. What nation? 
the nation of that bad fig tree. Of course, that's what the subject is. That's why he said, learn the parable of the fig tree. He's talking about the one worldism that Antichrist shall set and operate from Yerushalayim. Wake up. That whosoever shall say unto this nation, this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. Whoever wants to try to destroy Satan's little network and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. In other words, if you want to work against that one world system, do it God's way. Handle it in the order of the parable of the fig tree and you'll have results. You'll be successful. God was not talking about a mountain. He set forth this earth exactly as he wanted it. Every mountain range in place, fixed. He doesn't want his natural beauty hindered. He's talking about this nation of the money changer, the bad fig, the evil fig, the bad fruit. Goes to Jeremiah chapter 24. Verse 24, God instructing Jeremiah. Verse 1, the Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. After that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive uh, Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah with the carpenters and smiths from Jerusalem and had brought them to Babylon. I want you to note, first of all, that the majority of Judah had already been taken captive. All we have left over is a residue and a remnant of the princes. That's important. Why did he say set this before the temple? Because this would be where Antichrist himself would sit. Now learn about the figs. Verse 2. One basket had very good figs, uh, even like the figs that are first ripe. That means your first fruits, your first offering. That's like God's elect. All right? And the other basket had very naughty figs, uh, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. In other words, this was your goat figs, the capri, not fit to eat. This is the Kenites from that very tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is to say Satan, his own offspring. And of course, those of the elect, the followers of the tree of life, which is to say Yeshua, Messiah, Jesus. Verse 3. Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs. The good figs, very good. And the evil, very evil and cannot be eaten, they are so evil. And believe me, they are, as they continue. Now, it is important that you note your geographical location, take note of it. It's Jerusalem, right in the very temple, and that's where it will take place. That's what, that's what Jesus cleansed after wilting and cursing that big. And so it sits there, whereby in the very near future, he will also destroy that temple, and we shall build the Millennium Temple. Rightfully, ours, we shall take it after Antichrist reign, not on our command, but the command of Almighty God. Okay, verse 4, let's keep going with it. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Five, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge. I'm going to recognize. I'm going to um, bless them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. You underline that in your mind. I have sent them into this captivity for their good. Now what's very important is that you know this. This same Jeremiah, will take the tender twigs, the twin tender twigs of Zedekiah, his daughters. These daughters will go with this Jeremiah into Egypt. Later, they will migrate to the Isles, the British Isles. Jeremiah, the old man that appeared with those daughters, as it is written and as it is recorded in the history of our people, 
For I will set mine eyes upon them for good. Who? The tender twigs and those that obeyed him. You see, a lot of people are not going, would say to Jeremiah, we're not going into Babylon. We're not going into captivity. The same as you have the deceived today that say, you're not going through Antichrist's reign. You're going to fly away. The same false teachers are present today that were present to, at this exact same time in history in relationship to the parable of the fig. Them for good, and I will bring them again to this land. We're going back. And I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. The good trees that are in Jerusalem now will come down when Antichrist appears, for he will take over as king of kings, so to speak. Fake Jesus, uh, anti-Jesus, or instead of Christ. Most of the world will follow after him, but God says, this remnant I will bless for their good. Uh, verse 7, and I will give them an heart to know me. That's a mind. In their minds, they're going to know me. Some of you have a destiny, and you know him well, and you know the fake, and you know the fakes in this world today. So innocent fruit deception, so be it. I, I, I love them, but that does not change the fact that they are wrong, according to God's word. Continuing, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. Have you done that? Do you want to serve him? Are you willing to stand against the deception to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you? Are you willing, do you have the courage to know that God's promise is that they cannot touch one hair on your head while you are in his service as it is written in Luke 21? He wants you, some, very few, understand and have turned their whole heart back to God and accept his word, enjoy studying it getting familiar with the letter our Father has written to us, uh, understanding the migrations of our people, not deceived by false teachers of these end times. What about this other basket, though? We've still got them to contend with. Verse 8. And as the evil figs, or let's talk about the evil figs a moment, which cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Surely, thus saith the Lord, so will I give Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and his princes, and the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land, and them that dwell in the land of Egypt. Do you know what residue is? Residue is not Israel. Residue here is the Nephinim that came into the temple. That's a term that means given to service. They claimed to be priests, but they were fakes. False teachers, the same as you have today, if they teach other or contrary to the word of God. If they teach contrary to the chronological order of events, which are so simply laid forth in God's word to deceive our people. This residue are not children of Israel. They are Kenites, and you name it. You've got the whole lot there. Zedekiah, what would happen to him? Because he refused to obey God and listen to the false teachers, God caused him to be blinded. How did God cause him to be blinded? Because Nebuchadnezzar was his servant, God's servant. This coward, Zedekiah, dug through a hole in the wall after he saw it was a reality and they were going into captivity, rushed to a camp nearby. Nebuchadnezzar overtook him and gouged his eyes out. And what about the princes of Zedekiah, his sons? Nebuchadnezzar, on arriving in Babylon, had been killed as well as Zedekiah. They amounted to nothing because they would not listen to the priest of God, the teachers that God sent, namely this one Jeremiah, but preferred to listen to the priest that babbled a Baal. It says, Zedekiah being blinded, was a sign of how they will be blinded, yes, in these end times, concerning the parable of the fig. Don't let yourself be blinded. It's real easy. All you've got to do is get wrapped up in the emotionalism and be sung to sleep in their little pen where they feed milk and baby bottles and keep diapering you, even if you're there for 30 years, teaching nothing but salvation and baptism. 
Praise God for them. But that's the first step. Then after you take the first step, learn to walk, learn to run, learn to girt yourself. That's to, to uh, uh, well, we, we all understand what the term girt means. In other words, be ready to do battle. Be mature. Nine. I will deliver, the speaking of that residue, that scum, Jesus mentioned them well in, in Matthew 23, verse 2. He said, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses, the offspring of the serpent. That's what the residue is, Kenites, bad pigs. Then I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt. For whose earth? The re hurt the residue and all the people as well, because they would take deception with them. To be a reproach and a proverb, a taunt and a curse in all places whither I shall drive them. Taught and a curse in all places whither I shall drive them. And I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence among them. The famine for hearing the truth of God's word. They'd rather lullaby you into making a little short trip to an altar and be diapered. Till they be consumed from off the land that I gave unto them and to their fathers. There won't be any left there. And praise God for it. Jesus uh, brought a curse on the fig tree that it wilted. Turn with me, real quickly. Let's go to I. Real quickly, let's go to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter thirty-four. Let's learn a little more about the fig, if we may. Verse one. Listen carefully. This is a prophecy concerning the approaching of that great day of the Lord, when Jesus shall return again to cleanse the temple. It'll be better than a whip and a cat of nine tails this time. 34.1, come near you nations to hear and hearken. You come in close and you listen. Ye people, let the earth hear and all that is therein. That means every person, every creed, every color, every uh, peoples, the world and all things that come forth of it. All you men of the world, listen to the word of God. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, not part of them, all of them, because at the time this takes place, they will all be steeped in one worldism. Even as you see this great nation, as it's being pulled away from within to draw it into that condition. Upon all nations and his fury, Upon all their armies, he hath utterly destroyed them, he hath delivered them to the slaughter. In other words, there has been a divine ban placed upon them. Do you know he's going to destroy the armies? Might surprise some of you and it might shock you by peace, a fake peace, for Antichrist shall come in prosperously and peacefully. Those armies shall rear the head again. Idumea, Edom, Russia. When Antichrist grows tired of those voices that make the stand against him, but God shall intercede whereby all the world, not man intercede, but God, whereby all the world will know that he is Yahweh, our Father. Three, their slain also shall be cast out and their stink shall come up out of, of their carcasses and the mountain shall be melted with their blood. Do you remember that mountain? I told you you could move into the sea. We're going to. It will be melted. Four, sharpen up and learn the parable of the fig. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, even the heavens themselves. You should, what is the host? That's the many armies of God, both the true and the false. Michael casting Satan and his bad angels out on this earth uh, through this consummation. And the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. And all their host, that's that army, shall fall down. As the leaf falleth off from the vine, or the fading leaf. Have you ever seen a leaf fall that is faded, that is wilted, and it flutters as it circles to the earth? And as falling fig from the fig tree. Understand? You know, have you ever seen an overripe fig drop from a fig tree and see it when it contacts the earth? Clump. When you think of it as a man, it's not a pretty sight. 
5. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Do you know what God's sword is? His two-edged sword is his tongue, which is his truth. Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. Behold, it shall come down upon Adumia. That's to say Edom. That's Russia of today. Russia, remember, would live by the sword, but they would die by the sword, and so they shall. And upon the people of my curse to judgment. What people of the curse? Learn the parable of the fig tree. And you will know who the people of the curse are. It's the people that originated the hiding behind the fig leaf. Verse 6. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness. And with the blood of lambs and goats and with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath they sacrificed in Basra. You know where Basra is? That's the fortress of Edom. That is to say of Russia. And a great slaughter in the land of Edomia. We, we purchased Alaska from Russia. Wake up. It's going to be a burial ground on one of the borders. None of the cities, the city, no city will be touched. If you want to know, I'm not going to show it to you on the character generator, but if you want to know what day this is, skip on to verse 8. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion, of true Zion. It's coming. That old fig tree, that host in heaven, rolled up as a scroll, and the untimely figs cast uh, to this earth. Uh, the people of his curse, he's telling you who they are. Now, that should remind you of the scripture. Because he wanted you to know from that prophecy concerning the fig, the approximate time and the events that would consummate. You know when it happens? Turn with me to the sixth chapter of Revelation. As you're turning there, I want to fill you in a little bit. This is where the fake white horse comes. This is when the white horse appears, and most people are going to think it is Jesus come to rapture them away. He comes in peace. He has a bow, taxon in the Greek, uh, many false colors, like symbolizing the bow around Almighty God, the rainbow, the Shekinah glory. But he has no glory. And it continues on through the seals, which you are supposed to have in your forehead, and we have taught you, don't forget them, for we are within the sixth seal as we read verse 12. I'm sorry, as we read verse 13. Let's pick it up there. The sixth seal opens in verse 12. Listen to the events of that time. 13, Revelation chapter 6. And the stars of heaven fell upon the earth. Remember where we were reading in Isaiah. Even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And so it is, beloved. The people of the curse shall fall. And the heaven departed as a scroll. Remember when it said in Isaiah, rolled up as a scroll. Well, how could Isaiah sound like even the book of Revelation? The same author, friend, written by a different pen, but Almighty God, the same in a day, the same voice spoke to both men as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. That group of ten leaders making up the seven dominions called one worldism shall fall. We will drive it into the sea. I assure you, our only army will be the vengeance of Almighty God, but it shall be accomplished uh, by him. Fifty. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, every bondman, every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Do you know why they hid themselves? They thought they were about to rapture out, church full after church full after church full. And then come to find out they had only worshipped Satan, along with the untimely figs. They hadn't learned the parable of the fig tree. They listened rather to the fakies who teach, don't worry, you're going to fly away. That, that is not biblical, and yet it is taught by the majority today. The majority has been wrong since the beginning, so don't think strange of it. However, I assure you, they will not hear until it's too late. 
Does that mean they're going to hell? No. We're going to teach them in the millennium with Christ as our chief priest. Verse 16. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The high muckety ducks of the church age who felt they had a star-studded crown are going to be ashamed to trace, or to face rather the true Christ. For rather than having on a wedding garment, they're going to have a garment that is soiled with whoredoms, uh, with Antichrist. And not only they themselves uh, practicing whoredom, but having led uh, those they were responsible for, their sheep, uh, all to the slaughter of Antichrist. It shall happen. It's not going to be a happy day for them. It will be for us. For we will have to pick them up in tender love and let them know they're not going to burn in hell yet. But they will have an opportunity to learn through the millennium. Then they will stand by their works alone. That's why in Revelation chapter 20, at the final judgment, no faith enters into it. Now don't let that frighten anyone. I said at the end of the millennium, faith is your belief in he that you have not seen. They will see him in the millennium. Therefore, when Satan is released a short season, they are judged by works alone. Might not be all that easy as you might think. 17, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? You can. If you understand this parable, if you understand the fig tree and what it possesses, when did it start? Do you remember Revelation then, chapter 13, where this ten-headed political system, ten rulers of this earth, rise from the sea, the sea being people, documentation, Revelation 17, dividing this earth up into seven dominions and being ruled by instead of Jesus. Revelation 17 makes it very clear. He that goes into the pit shall come out and reign as the son of perdition for one hour, which is that five-month period of Revelation 9. You were given wisdom in the 18th verse of that 13th chapter of Revelation. It said, here is wisdom. Count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. You are told and instructed that, and the word count is not to count one, two, three. It is a Greek word that means count by enumerating the stones, that's the children, over a long period of time. Stones from the rock, but the wrong rock. You're told to count them. What does this have to the fig? You hold on, you'll find out in a minute. But then the 666, you are given two numbers, but the obsolete number is not brought forth to you and you're not taught, for most don't know. The word is stigma. It means a mark incised for a period of service over a long period of time. Count all the way back to the beginning of the parable of the fig. When did it start then? What can we say on these things? Open your word to Genesis chapter 3. Naturally, you, to the start of the parable of the fig, you must go all the way to the beginning. You will remember in chapter 3, the old serpent, that old devil, which is the dragon even of the end times, it's the same entity, said to the woman, partake of the tree. She said, oh, we can't do that. For God has told us in the day that we, that we are not to eat or to touch naga. That means to lie with a woman. That, we're not, that we'll die. He said, oh, go ahead. Your eyes will be open." The word in the Hebrew is atash, etz, uh, which is tree. This is the trunk. What is the bad fig? And what is the fruit of it? He said, test the fruit. Are you able to? Eve partook of that fruit. And she conceived the first twin. Let's read of it. Chapter 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes 
and a tree to be desired to make one wise. What kind of tree do you think this was? In reality, it was real, but they were in a grove. And she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened. This is to say, atash, which means their backbone opened to the point that they're through the central nervous system, they were able to recognize sin. And they knew that they were naked when this knowledge came to them of what they had done. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons to cover where they had eaten the apple. No, that isn't what God's word says, is it? Because they didn't eat an apple. Where did they get the fig leaves? And ever since this time, the fig leaf has been symbolic of something hidden, like the people with the curse upon them, praying for the mountains to fall on them, because the truth has been hidden from them for all these years. Where do you think they got those fig trees? After the seduction of Eve, spoken of by St. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the word is um, beguiled in the English, expatio in the Greek, Holy seduced. Don't play games or lie to children concerning God's word and let them believe a lie and be damned. But teach them truth. They gathered leaves from the very trees that the event happened within. Fig leaves. And that fig leaf hid in the womb of the woman. That first son came who was a murderer. The first murder in the beginning, Jesus told you of him in St. John chapter 8, verse 44. You read it. He said, you're of your father, the first murderer. That's Cain. You are of your father, the devil, when he talks to those cursed uh, with the bad fig, the children that are symbolic of it. In other words, know where Cain is. For Cain, as sure as those leaves covered the room, that's where the sin was. So God cursed Cain, placed a curse upon him, and marked him with the mark of the fig leaf. And that fig leaf has been upon him ever since. Do you understand now why Jesus said, learn the parable of the fig tree? It covers the migrations of both the children of God and the evil children. He said, don't you remember? I told you these things when I was with you. It was so simple. But how soon people drift from the truth. Yes, it is it any wonder Jesus wilted that fig tree that the leaves covered the womb that carried Cain. For it was Cain and Cain's father that made the crucifixion necessary to bring about the forgiveness of sins because of the evil teachings and the bad pigs even from the world that was uh, in through this world. God is calling out a people in this end times to know and to understand the simplicity in which our teacher Jesus uh, taught us, the Savior, our Savior. Do you have ears to hear? Do you have a destiny? Do you understand the urgency of reading your father's letter, his direction in these end times? I hope you've enjoyed the parable of the fig tree. As Jesus told you firmly, learn it. I tell you firmly, don't forget it.